Watch Budget 2018 with Bloomberg Quinn. Good morning, you're watching Daybreak on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, let's look at the headlines. Asian stocks are off to a positive start as investors continue to bet on corporate earnings. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index is on course to post its best monthly gain since March 2016. Finance Minister Arun Jetli will table the country's economic survey in Parliament today on the first day of the budget session. HDFC and Tech Mahindra are two nifty companies scheduled to report earnings today. And Galaxy Surfactants becomes the fourth company to tap the primary market in 2018. The issue opens for subscription today. Let's turn to the international markets now and US stocks closed sharply higher on Friday as quarterly earnings topped estimates. The major indices also posted weekly gains of at least 2%. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle wraps up all the U.S. market action in this report. Friday ended with a bullish bang for stocks in the U.S. The three major averages of the Dow, S&P 500, the Nasdaq finished sharply higher. Both the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq up more than 1% and carving out new all-time highs, record-closing highs for the three major averages up on the week as well for the fourth up week in a row. In fact, right now, the S&P 500 on pace for its best month since March of 2016. Now, behind all of this bullish action, of course, optimism around tax reform. Plus, there have been many bullish earnings reports. This includes Intel. The chip maker did beat fourth quarter earnings estimates. They also gave a positive uh, outlook for the full year and the current quarter. On this, Intel climbed by more than 10 percent to its highest level since 2000, in turn giving a tailwind to the overall chip chip space up more than 3% on the day for its best day of 2018. Now, speaking of its best day of the year, Twitter. Twitter spiked higher by more than 9% on takeover speculation. And Bloomberg LP, of course, does have a breaking news network on Twitter, TikTok. VMware, another stock that spiked on the session on the possibility that Dell may increase its ownership from 82% to 100%. Now, looking ahead to next week, front and center earnings from lots of the big tech and internet names, including Amazon, Facebook, Alphabet, and Apple. Plus the dollar. In this past week, the dollar had its worst week since May of last year, down more than 1.5% on mixed messages from the White House, plus uh, the ECB talking up the euro, having a negative effect on the dollar. Will that continue next week? But overall, it was a very bullish week for the financial markets in the U.S. In New York, Abigail Doolittle, Bloomberg News. Well, Asian markets have opened positive, taking strong cues from uh, the close on Wall Street last week. Uh, the Nikkei in Japan got off to a strong start, rising 0.6% earlier. It's come off a little bit and it's up 0.5%, but gains in Japan, South Korea and Australia have so far helped extend the MSCI Asia-Pacific Index rise this year to 7.8% on course for its best month since March 2016. Now, investor focus this week will be on earnings and economic data. Last week, markets were jolted, uh, as you have already been told, by conflicting positions on the dollar from US President Donald Trump and some of his top officials. This week will also include the Federal Reserve meeting, which will, which will be presided over by Janet Yellen for the last time. Let's turn to the Indian markets now, and Darshan Mehta and Agam Vakil are here as usual to set you up for the day's trade and to tell you what's happening in the futures and options space. Morning, guys. Russian strong cues from overseas. Yeah, you, you're right, because uh, what happened was we were shot on Friday, but the SGX50 was working. So on Friday, it was up almost uh, six points, and today uh, it's a record uh, opening that probably we will see about the 11,100, close until we'll come close to the 11,000. 150 mark in trade. So clearly very strong cues coming in from uh, the, from the SGX Nifty. The other aspects of we were closed on Friday, but you know, the Hang Seng was up 500 points. The Brazilian markets were up 2%. So global cues are extremely strong. And that is what reflected on the ADRs also. HDFC Bank, Dr. Eddie's, Wipro, Tata Motors, all of them reacting positively uh, on uh, as far as their trade was concerned on Friday. ICICI, Vedanta, Infosys. So all the ADRs ended with a positive bias on Friday. 
Now, if you're looking at what happened as far as crude is concerned, crude is trading muted, but still crude continues to trade close to the $70 barrel per mark. Even for the last two days of the week, even on Thursday, Friday, crude was trading rather muted. Uh, so crude, but still managing to hold on to those levels. As far as base metals are concerned, very mixed set of closing that was there for on the base metals. So if you're looking at some of the base metal, aluminium was up, zinc was up, and you also had tin. Tin was the best performing index, which was up almost 2%. Copper, nickel, as well as lead were trading on the lower side. As far as comics copper is concerned, it's trading with a positive bias. Even in China, if you're looking at some of the commodities, all of them have opened with a positive bias. The big move is coming in again on the zinc front. Zinc is up almost 2.7% in China. Copper is trading up. Uh, the other commodities like aluminium and steel are trading muted at this point of time, but all of them with a positive bias. As far as uh, the precious metals are concerned, nothing much happening. It's absolutely flat gold, silver, platinum and palladium. Uh, they're trading rather muted in trade. Now, as far as the fund flows are concerned, FIS are extremely strong buyers. They bought in almost 900 crores in the cash market. DIS sold in almost 965 crores in the market. So we are buying in close to $2 billion in the cash market as far as FIS are concerned. DIS turned net, net sellers with a net sell figure that came in on, on Thursday. Uh, as far as you know, some of the sectors and stocks are concerned, after a big rally, Nifty managed to consolidate. It was down almost 16 points in trade. This is on Thursday, but uh, some of the sectors that managed to gain, Nifty Metal was muted, but uh, the PSU banks as well as auto continue to bleed. 5% drop on the Nifty PSU bank index. Now, as far as uh, the Nifty is concerned, uh, it was down 16 points. No major losers or gainers, uh, but clearly at this point of time, uh, Agam is here. And Agam, what are the FNOQs indicating? Record highs again on opening. Uh, what will happen on the market? It's a new series now. Absolutely, Darshan. Uh, we have seen uh, world strength come in and we've seen a lot of uh, writing in the lower and lower level puts. But uh, let me start off with the February series and what we've seen naturally an increase in open interest as far as this open interest, uh, uh, sorry, uh, your, your February series goes. Uh, about 72% added, but that's also because uh, we've seen unwinding in the previous series. That said, moving on, as far as the Nifty Bank goes, again, another 41% added there. And uh, the India Volatility Index, uh, interestingly, uh, is where we are looking at a little bit of, uh, you know, a decline. So coming off from the levels of 18, this is after the expiry that we saw. That said, the WIX is expected to remain high as we move in towards the union budget. But for now, the put call ratio has also fallen to around 1.42. So a lot of those puts have been unwound. Uh, that said, moving in. Uh, in terms of uh, you know your several other uh, stocks that we're watching out for, uh, well, uh, we do have NIT Technologies, which has seen fresh longs, and similarly, uh, similarly, Adani Enterprises as well, which has also seen fresh longs. So they've seen accumulation across all series. We'll be watching out for these, and we'll, we'll be watching out for the Nifty, whether or not it makes a new high today in today's year of trade. Absolutely, Agam. Thanks so much for that. Let's turn now to the rupee in the bond market and Saloni the Hanukkah is here to tell you all about those two markets. Morning, Saloni. Good morning, Alex. So the rupee extended losses for the second week on Thursday and it was down about 21 paise or close to three tenths of percent lower against the dollar. Meanwhile, rally in India's foreign exchange reserves continued for the fourth straight week and it touched a record high of 414.8 billion mark for the week and for the week ended 19 January. On the global front, Asian currencies were trading higher on the back of broad-based dollar weakness uh, after US Treasury Secretary supported the view of a weaker dollar to boost country's export. <laughs> Elsewhere, uh, okay, for the week, dollar index was down over 1.5%, its biggest weekly decline since uh, in nearly seven months. Uh, elsewhere, pound extended gains above the $1.41 mark uh, after UK GDP showed that the econ economy grew at a faster pace than expected. Uh, While well, coming back home, dollar rupee is trading at 63.59 levels against the dollar, which indicates a flat to a weaker opening for Indian rupee in today's trade. Moving on to bond market, sovereign bonds slipped for the third week while yield on the new 10-year benchmark rose one basis point for the entire week. However, particularly on Thursday, it was uh, up about three basis point. And lastly, global funds increased their rupee debt holdings on Thursday. They infused close to 900 crore according to NSDL data. Thanks so much for that, uh, Saloni. Now, the budget session of parliament is set to begin today with an address from President Ramnath Kovind. However, all eyes will be on the government's economic survey 
which will be tabled at, in Parliament uh, at noon. Now, focus will be on the government's growth projections. The mid-term economic survey tabled in August last year said that achieving the target of 6.75 to 7.5 percent in the current financial year would be difficult owing to a slowdown in the first half. Now, focus will also be on the trends post the introduction of the GST. Collections from the uniform tax law have seen a downward trend since July, although they did see a rebound last month. Now, the midterm economic survey had also signaled considerable room for monetary policy easing. It will be interesting to note what the commentary is now, considering that inflation has picked up and also there has been an unfavorable rise in commodity prices, especially in crude oil. Let's shift focus now to commodity and speak about uh, all those uh, cues uh, from those markets. Uh, Jayesh Kilnani joins in with all the details. Morning, Jayesh. Morning, Alex. So we're looking at a three-year high for oil prices. Brent now comfortably above uh, the 70 per barrel mark and WTI above that 66 per barrel mark. Now, you know, uh, the main contributor to this is uh, the dollar, which has once again resumed its uh, decline. And a weaker dollar is seen as supporting crude oil prices higher. Also, we understand uh, from data that, uh, you know, hedge funds have uh, boosted their net bullish positions on oil prices to a record high. And backed by this, Bank of America says that oil prices can be capped at nearly $80 per barrel. And also, JP Morgan has raised their forecast uh, for the first half of uh, this year to about 78 per barrel. So, you know, uh, positive news and bullish commentary coming in from the oil market. Now, if you look at the base metal space, we had a mixed close like Dashan was uh, mentioning on the London Metal Exchange. So, you had aluminium, zinc and tin that closed positive. And on the other hand, we had uh, copper, lead and nickel which closed negative on the exchange. Uh, however, nickel did post its biggest weekly gain since the month of uh, November. As, and as far as precious metals are concerned, we are seeing gold futures have now you know, started trading comfortably above the 13.50 per uh, ounce mark. And once again, the dollar index has boosted this trade, which has now traded you know, below the 90 mark for four days in a row. Thanks so much for that, Jayesh. Let's move on now to the primary markets, and we're talking about the fourth issue just of the first month of the year, and we're talking about Galaxy Surfactants. The company plans to raise about 937 crore rupees through its issue that opens today. Let's bring in Somit Sarkar, who's standing by with all the details for that company. Somit, it's a public issue, as in it's uh, an open offer. Uh, it's an offer for, offer for sales. Also the biggest that. IPO in tw so far in 2018. Now the company is looking to raise as much as 937 crore rupees at a price band of 1,470 to 1,480. And at the upper end of the valuation, uh, at the upper end of the price band, the company would be valued at more than 5,200 crore rupees. Now, if you see this IPO is a complete offer for sale, where the promoters will be selling shares worth 318 crore rupees, while the existing public shareholders or the investors in the company will be selling shares worth 619 crore rupees. Now, the company is a leading manufacturer of surfactants and other specialty ingredients. Now, surfactants is used as a raw material which, uh, for products which are used in personal hygiene and sanitation while special ingredients is used as a raw material in products used as sunscreen, fairness cream and other personal care products. Now if you see the company generates most of its revenue by selling surfactants but going forward they are looking to increase this uh, share of specialty products to their revenue because they pro uh, provide a higher margin. Currently 67% of their revenue comes from selling surfactants. Also if you see the company sells their products in more than 70 countries and it generates 65% of its revenue from overseas. Now they sell for, get 45% of their revenue from Africa, Middle East and Turkey and 35% from uh, India and 20% from rest of the world. Now the company's major clients include Kevin Care, Colgate, Darbar, PNG, HUL and with the and if you see with the top 10 clients the company shares a relationship of more than 5 years and they currently contribute around 59% to the uh, company's uh, top line and if you see the company has around 7 manufacturing facilities of which 5 are in India and 2 are outside India and the average capacity utilization of all these 7 manufacturing uh, facilities is close to 62.5% as of the fir fi first half of financial year 2018. Now, 
if you see uh, there are very few players in india which purely manufactures manufactures surfactants but the, uh, now there are players like some of the listed players like godrej industries india glycol and arthi industries do manufacture surfactant but it's a very small part of the top line so if you see the financials of galaxy its revenue net profit and ebitda grew at a compounded annual growth rate over fy14 to fy17 at 8.4% 24.4% and 7.5% now the reason behind the double digit growth in its net profit and a single digit growth in its revenue is that the company's interest burden has come down substantially over a period now if you see uh, from fy14 uh, where the uh, now the leverage has also come down from 1.2 times in fy15 to around 0.6 times as of h first half of the financial year 2018 and the interest burden if you see it has come down from 34 crores in fy15 to around 15 crores in the first half of financial year 2018 uh, so it, it it has substantially come down for the company also if you see the return ratios of the company it is very healthy it return on equity is close to 24% return on capital employed is 30% and return on asset is close to 11.4% now if you see uh the uh, valuations of the company at the upper end of the price band and on an annualized basis for fy18 the price to earnings is 35 times the market cap to sales is 2.2 times the ev to ebitda is 20 times while price to book is 8.3 times so these are very healthy valuations and are not that expensive valuations when it comes to uh, when, it, when at the upper end of the price band thanks so much for that somit now a lot of key numbers to watch there so if you missed any of that for the offer for sale uh, you can go on to the website and find more details there but let's turn to the earnings for the day and the big nifty earnings the first one that we're talking about is hdfc it's likely to receive a boost from uh, uh, on net profit owing to a one time gain shraddha babla is here with uh, the other expectations shraddha first off what's the one time gain from Well, yes, uh, Alex. So it's uh, the stake sale that the company made in its uh, uh, insurance uh, subsidy. That's HDFC Standard Life Insurance. So net profit on account of that will seem 168 percent higher at 4,556 crores versus 1,700 crores last year. So that's the number that the street is working with. Now they will report capital gains of 5,250 crores on account of the stake sale in HDFC Standard Life via an IPO. And the company has already said that of which 30% of the amount will be uh, utilized to increase the provision coverage ratio. That part. a uh, broadly is expected to be an inline uh, uh, steady sort of a quarter with spreads expected to remain close to that 2.3% level loan growth is seen at about 15 to 16% in line uh, you know with the trend that we have seen in the prior quarters and asset quality is expected to remain um, you know healthy over the past several quarters that's the trend we have seen for hdfc so a uh, key thing to watch out for will be the management commentary on mortgage demand and the opportunity in affordable housing remember uh, this is the segment that they are seem to be uh, bullish on uh, and uh, for uh, this segment as well they had raised close to 13000 uh, crores in the month of uh, uh, december january so well, let's see what they have to say on the affordable housing bit the movement in spreads and margins on individual loans is another thing that we'll track as well as the asset quality trends in the corporate loan book but broadly a steady and in line quarter bottom line boost only because of that exceptional uh, gains but otherwise should be a uh, close to 14 to 15% uh, growth that we're expecting thanks so much for that uh, shraddha but the second big earnings that we're talking about are tech mahindras uh, and that company is likely to be weighed down by lower other income agam vakil has all the details there morning uh, i mean we already said morning but uh, what are the details here agam Yes. Good morning, Alex. Uh, well, uh, on the whole, as far as tech mahindra is concerned, we are expecting well, uh, well, at least in terms of the top line, uh, well, a subdued quarter. But then operationally, it is going to be a much stronger one, considering uh, you know they have been uh, you know leveraging on their uh, operational abilities, because of which we can expect about a bit of margins to expand to around 11.8 percent as against 10.5 percent. And uh, net profits, on the other hand, I, I expect a decline six percent sequentially. This is on account of lower income. Now there are. some areas of concern for tech mahindra first one is lcc as well as combiva to a certain extent uh, you know we've seen a mixed 
uh, you know, uh, performances from uh, both these uh, subsidiaries of the company. And uh, that said, uh, we are also looking at mixed expectations from the from the enterprise business. Uh, communications vertical, however, is expected to pick up, and that is likely to uh, provide that boost as far as Tech Mahindra is concerned. What we are looking at for, of course, is uh, you know your, the, uh, the management's commentary on margins as as well as productivity updates on turnaround in LCC specifically, and of course pricing trends uh, from the, the top accounts. But on the whole, we're expecting a mixed quarter from Tech Mahindra. Right. Thanks, Agam. Let's uh, turn to the other stocks that you have to watch out for in the news today, and Shraddha Babla has an entire list to tell you about. Shraddha, what do you have? Well, yes, uh, Alex, starting off with FTC Limited. Now, they've got a GMP approval from the UK drug regulator, that is the UK MHRA, and this is for its ophthalmic manufacturing facility at Waluj Norangabad. So, we may see some positive reaction there. Pratap Snacks, which has signed a new contract for third party manufacturing of potato chips. You have Havels India, which will set up a new uh, manufacturing facility for consumer durables in Rajasthan with a total investment of 360 crores. Amrutanjan Health, which will consider stock split on February 13th. Hindustan Copper, which will consider raising of funds via QIP. You also have FM Industries, which has said that the plant and machinery was damaged in a fire incident at a Hosur uh, unit. So we could see some negative reaction coming in on that counter. And according to a PTI report, JSW Steel may double its bid for Bhushan Steel to 30,000 crores. So we could see a uh, significant reaction on uh, Bhushan Steel as well. And lastly, in a surprise uh, bulk deal, you have have uh, Vakrangi, which is a listed entity, which has picked up 0.5% stake in PC Jewelers on Thursday. So keep an eye out on all those names. Thanks, Shraddha, for that. Now, at the World Economic Forum in Davos that was concluded last week, almost all the participants used shuttle buses to get around. Mirka Doshi took a ride on one such bus to see who she'd end up pooling with. Find out. the best way to get around Davos when you're here for the World Economic Forum's annual meeting, mostly because it's the only way. There are no taxis to be had in the city. Very occasionally will you find one, and the buses don't ply any of the main routes that you need to use to go from hotel to hotel, or from the Congress Center to hotel and back. So the shuttle is the lifeline of every West delegate. So we're going to try a few lines and give you an idea of how many different people we can meet here uh, in the shuttle, which countries they come from and what their WEF has been like this year. Come travel with us. So what are the chances that the first person we bump into uh, in the shuttle uh, is one of the best known journalist editors of our times, uh, Farid Zakaria. Thank you very much for agreeing to speak with us. And what's the WEF been like for you this year? Look, I always find it fascinating because you get uh, people from all over the world. It's a genuinely in global conference. For somebody interested in the world, it's like being a kid in a candy store. Uh, so I, I always enjoy it. You heard Prime Minister Modi from India? It was a positive speech. I think he was hoping to parallel President Xi's speech from last year. And I think that was more tight and more disciplined. You know, you saw the difference between, in a way, a technocrat and a politician. Mm. Where Prime Minister Modi is used to extemporizing a little bit more and ranging widely and freely. Um, but the, you know, the general message was, was a good one. India's open for business and, you know, interested in an open world. I'm glad he talked about global warming because India has been one of the laggards on, on the issue. So, overall positive. I'm Sumit Jamwar. I uh, run a company called Global Gene Corp. I'm from India, but okay. I live in the UK. The most important thing is around uh, meeting new people. Um, and also there are conversations which are ongoing, which are, uh, you know, in terms of the relationship, in terms of uh, work that we are doing, uh, which is around genomics and just solving for the genetic, you know, problem of not having enough insights about, for example, the Indian population and other Asian or African or Latin American population. So that's the work we focus on uh, out of, you know, Boston, Cambridge, Singapore and India. And this is an excellent forum where you meet some world leaders, you meet some uh, people who are doing cutting edge work in technology and uh, that's where ideas start, right? Over a cup of coffee or something. I'm Stephen Fiddler. I'm a British. Uh, I'm British, but I work for the Wall Street Journal, American newspaper. Did anything stand out for you in this year's WEF? 
uh, the chaos around the snow on the first few days. <laughs> no um, but uh, I guess uh, the you know there's usually um, you know a lot of talk about the economy and that kind of thing. I think the the background there's background anxiety about even though the economy is going well, even though financial uh, markets are going very well, there's a background anxiety about what's happening in you know the world of trade, what's happening with geopolitical tensions in Asia and elsewhere, uh, and that kind of thing. So that was the thing that's mainly struck me so far. So my name is Martin Fischer. I'm uh, also a journalist from the Netherlands. Okay. From the biggest newspaper in the Netherlands, uh, the Telegraaf. How has the West been for you this, this year? It's the first time, so it was... It's your first time? Uh, it was rather confusing and overwhelming at first, especially because the first day the weather was very bad. It was not very easy to go to all the locations, mm -hmm. but it's very impressive. Um, I saw Al Gore, John Kerry, the King of Spain, the King of Belgium, <laughs> and, and you can talk to a lot of people. So it's uh, it's a lot, and uh, but it's very impressive. My name is Juanica Ventosa. I come from Portugal, and uh, I'm here in representing the Portuguese Association of uh, Retail Companies. And what's the fun thing both you ladies are going to do here in Davos? Great Portuguese wine. We can show you one. <laughs> oh. Uh, Oh, what do you know? A bottle of wine in the shuttle. <laughs> yeah, no. oh, great. The, the wine that have been offered to us to promote very good uh, wine producers that we have in our country. Excellent. It's a Cabernet Sauvignon. Yes, it is. And it's produced in a region and, nearby Lisbon. And how is that Lisbon. name? Can you pronounce that name for me? Yes, it's Quinta. Quinta. The Bacalua. The Bacalua. My name is Aziz Zabso. You're from Turkey? Yeah. Is this your first wear for your... Not really. I'm probably one of the seniors here. Yeah. Oh. Over 25, 26 fans. Do you have a Davos moment from the 23, 24 years that you've been here? <laughs> well, you just asked the gentleman about someone who met. I went to the Microsoft's. Uh, Bill Gates? Bill Gates. In, uh, a in a very interesting, not in a shuttle, actually in the toilet. In the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. It was just just beside me, and I thought I know this face from somewhere. <laughs> I looked again, and it was him. So I, you feel that they are human beings like you and me, <laughs> and that's good. <laughs> Have you had a Davos moment yet? And that usually is when you bump into someone you least expect it to. Uh, <laughs> mine was when I remember seeing Tony Blair like three inches yeah, away from yeah. me. Yeah, I, I had yours? a. I was talking to Kate Rayworth, that's a well-known British economist, about your book. I interviewed her uh, last, uh, lastly, and behind me I saw, oh, there's El Gore going, oh no, uh, and, uh, and and some other guys, and uh, uh, all all the, all the hot shots. And your best Davos moment. And I've been. This is, I think, my 22nd year of coming to Davos. So year, I don't okay. know that. Your best a, one in the last five years. Best, that's that's best the best way to narrow it. Uh, oh God, having dinner with Bill Gates. So we started this with Farid Zakaria, a famous journalist. We met another one from Britain. Uh, we met a retail delegation from Portugal, a retailer from Turkey, uh, briefly someone from Ramallah. Um, so that was, and, and of course, how to forget, uh, the gentleman from Netherlands. Uh, that's a sh small slice of what it's like to travel around in the shuttle here in Davos. Different people, different experiences, and great fun sometimes, unless you're in a hurry to get to your next spot, in which case the traffic here in Davos can be legendary. All right, I'm going to sign out now. Thanks very much for watching. Stay with Bloomberg Queen. Well, uh, there are also a few stories that you should consider reading on the website BloombergQueen.com. Here are a couple of them. First up, Saudi Arabia has freed Prince Al-Walid bin Talal and several of the kingdom's most prominent businessmen from detention. In the process, the Ritz-Carlton Hotel that served as a jail for the country's elite during a supposed crackdown on corruption has been cleared out. In Afghanistan, a bomb hidden in an ambulance killed and wounded scores of people at a police checkpoint in the capital Kabul on Saturday. A spokesperson of the Ministry of Public Health said that the death toll from the blast had risen to 95, while another 191 were wounded. Well, that's a somber note to end this edition of Daybreak On, but all you need to know is up next, so do stay tuned. This is Bloomberg Quint.